Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> the devil are you so here we are again it's thursday and um yeah i'm recording this on tuesday night it's let me look at the time here it's 9 35 i'm looking outside the window where i am now in gloucestershire and it's a clear sky it's a beautiful full moon and i hope that you are all well and uh things are going good uh, what's going on? Well, look, I want to just give a shout out quickly to another podcast, which is, and it's not going to be a podcast loving, don't just sort of, don't get your neck in a twist. But I was in London this weekend and Skip to the End, who are a great podcast, who we love, shouted us out as their recommendation of the week. And I didn't even know anything about it. They didn't tell me. So... I was walking back from my friend's flat where I was staying and it was pissing it down and I had my headphones in and I was really enjoying the episode and all of a sudden they were talking about their recommendations and each week they do a recommendation of certain sort of pop culture things. They do uh, books, films, television shows. Oh, hello, there we go. That's a message from... That's fine, don't worry about that. And... um. Their recommendation of a podcast was, yeah, it was the Two Shot Podcast. And Gemma spoke so warmly and eloquently and it was, she really got it. You know, she really got what we were trying to do about the conversations we have with people. And it really means a lot when... Uh, people shout us out and they, they they get what we do. Um, so, and I was, honestly, I was walking up Crouch Hill in the pouring rain off to get a breakfast sandwich. Don't judge me. It was a, it was a good sandwich. Um, and yeah, I got, I was, I was quite moved by it to be honest, because these things um, don't happen all the time. And when they do, it, it really, really means a lot. And it took me about four or five days to send it to producer Griff. And I sent it to him tonight and he listened to it and he was really overcome by it. So massive, massive thank you to Skip to the End and Gemma and Ben and Mark for the recommendation and the brilliant work they do. And look, if you don't subscribe to Skip to the End, then what are you doing? Come on. It's one of the best film podcasts out there. That and The Cinemile, two absolute bangers who shoot from the hip and tell it like it is, and that's what we want. What else? Okay, look, listen, right, here's the thing. If you've got tickets for Friday, which is tomorrow, October 18th, York Theatre Royal, then we can't wait to see you. We're going to hang out, we're going to have drinks, we'll do photos, we'll do whatever. It's going to be great, great night. But there's been a few people who we think really want to come, but they can't afford it, right? And we understand, right? We understand. So what we're going to do, we're going to give four tickets free. You're going to be our guests. All you need to do is email us. Why? No, it doesn't have to be a big thing. Just let us know that you want to come, right? And that you can't afford it. If you're on a minimum wage, if you're a student, if you're a drama student, whatever it is, we'll look after you, all right? All you've got to do is jump on the bus, jump on the train, get there. Everything else, we'll look after and we'll buy you a drink. We'll sort it out, right? Because you do so much for us, it's about time we did something for you. And it's about giving something back. Um, And this inspired, this was inspired this week by a few 
bands that I know who who give guest list tickets for people. And I thought, well, maybe we should do that. I think it's a, it's a sound thing to do. We should do that. Um, there's going to be loads of other people there. It's going to be a great night. So all you need to do is drop us an email, which is twoshotpod at gmail.com. Do it right now. It's first come, first served, all right? The first four, and that's it. You're on the list, and we will look after you. Get yourself there to York Theatre Royal. I think we're starting around 7.30. I would say get there about 6.45. Um, um, we'll be doing our sound check uh, in the afternoon, and then we've got JB Barrington coming on, doing some poetry, warming things up. And then I'll come on and bore people to tears. And then we'll liven things up again with the incredible Art Malik. I'm going to get some great stories. It's going to be a great conversation. I'm going to be in York. It's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Um, so this week, wow. Right. So do you remember last year we had the incredible Jimmy Akinbola on? Well... Outside, when we finished talking with Jimmy, I was outside in Maison Bateau, our Soho spiritual home, and we were having some photos taken, me and Jimmy, and an actress walked past who he knew, and he said, oh, Reiki, this is Craig, you, you should come on the podcast. And she was kind of flummoxed, and I was kind of flummoxed, and we didn't really know each other, and... I am so pleased. Things like this are fortuitous, and it's taken us, uh, well, over a year to get Reiki on. But Reiki Iola, my goodness me, this is an absolute stormer of an episode. She is phenomenal. I'm not overstating how incredible she is. I mean, we talk... Uh, we never met before, by the way. We, we met very, very briefly on the street... And we talk about um, anger, injustice, uh, hope, chance, change, uh, our lives. You can tell there's going to be a part two with this. She's extraordinary, and I really, really hope you enjoy it. I've got to go and do some ironing now. I know, that's my life. And then I've got to go to bed, and I'm on the school run. This is episode 102 with Reiki Iola. Enjoy, and we'll see you at the end. She's glorious. Well, the she's director speaks really, very highly. Of her, oh, she's I think one of my uh, dear, dear, dear friends. Is she? Yeah, 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 yeah. You've known her for a long time. Yeah, we've got a. Um, when did we? No, she took over. I was doing a play with Sam Morton. Well, movie. yeah. Oh, like 1993, three, four. And um, Sam did something to a knee, so Sharon stepped in. That's the first time we met. Right. But we've been really, really close for about eight years. Um, we, we've got a group called The Brunch Discussion. Is this, is this a WhatsApp group? No, no, no. No, about eight years ago, Sharon got a bunch of women together, and the common thing was that we were all either black or working class. Right. And we met at Giraffe on the South Bank, and... Uh, and she said, right, ladies, we're, we're reaching that age. And it was, it was like brunch, it was like half 11. So. Mm. We're reaching that age when this industry doesn't need us anymore, so let's take care of each other, let's try to stay relevant, let's try to stay in it, unless we want to leave. Let's not leave because we feel we've been pushed out. Yeah. And this network of women got to the point where there were about 40, between 40 and 50 people on the, the email group. Mm. And we would meet anywhere that was free, church halls, theatres, anyone that would have us. But then it got really... The, the admin got difficult because people were saying, can my mate so-and-so come? And then you'd be like, right, so I've got to add that person and so that person doesn't have any of that information. That, so the admin just got Built crazy. Up, yeah. So then uh, we said, oh, you know what, we sort of can't do this anymore because it's become this, it, 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 this beast of a thing that we can't manage. Then it stopped maybe for two years. Really? Because it seems like such an important thing. Oh, it was thing it was brilliant. To and, be doing. and we would share work and you we'd get homework like and everyone go and write something about their mothers, anything, anything you like. And mm. you'd hear the most extraordinary pieces of writing. It was brilliant. But then um you never knew 
sometimes you just, just didn't know who was in the room. You look around the circle and go, I don't know who anybody is and I don't like to tell them because I've, I've had email communication but I don't actually know. Yeah. Um, and also, so it, the larger it got, I mean, there's something so safe about a small group. Yes. And certainly people that you know that you can divulge certain stories. Exactly. But if it, it gets it to did a wider get a bit community. Like, you know, does anybody know who that woman is? Is she is she even in the industry or did she wander in? Nobody knows. And we right. Don't. So we, when, we, when I say we closed it down, we we just stopped organising meetings and without people leading it, it just, nobody else took over, so it just stopped. And then about two years later, Sharon said, look, can I just have a couple of you get together? I just need, I just need to share some stuff. And it was five of us. Sharon Duncan Brewster, um, Michelle Austin, who had the leading white teeth at the kiln. Mm. She was on the post. Ashley Miller, who's an actor turned writer turned academic. Um, Natasha Gordon and me. And we would meet, and then we just decided, since it was only five of us, we could meet front of house at the National and just share any stuff. So this happened a few times, and we'd meet every four, five, six weeks or so. And uh, and then one day, Tash sent an email saying, do you mind if we give over the next meeting to this thing I've written, which she talked about, but we hadn't seen any of it. Yeah. I just want to hear it out loud. Sure. This is someone who'd never had anything produced before. And so she emailed it to us and we just sat and she, and she, I, I've got the email, I found it recently, where she said, oh, Ricky, if you read that part, and Michelle, if you read those two parts, and blah, 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 and I'll read in whenever someone <clears throat> seems to be talking to themselves. Yeah. And we sat round, front of the National, read this thing, and at the end we went, fuck it, Tash, you've written a play. No. Oh, fuck. It's a proper play, play. The play is called Nine Night. No way. Yeah. So you, she read that to you for the yeah. very first time. And I found time. the email because people think we've kind of made that story up. But I have the email where she said, "Right, so Reggie, if you read this and you read this, you read this, and if you read the published script, she's thanked us all. We're all acknowledged." Right. So we, I was like, I remember jumping on, and she maintains that I said it should go on here. I just remember screaming. That's all I remember because I thought this is this is not this because a lot of us have this and had the seeds of something. Mm keep that scene, bin the rest kind of work. But we went, no, this is a play. Yeah. It's complete. Um, Do you think she needed that confidence from you to sort of keep the ball rolling, or was she...? Well, I think... I like to think that even without it, she'd have recognised that it was a great piece of work. But we yeah. then started screaming, send it to send it to him, he reads scripts, send it to her, she'll read it, send it to them, they'll read it. Send it. Um, and didn't know... We didn't know if it would just lead to somebody saying, oh, yeah, you can write, so we'll commission you to write something else. Yeah. We didn't know where it would go. And then a few months later, we got a message from her saying, the National have commissioned my play. Oh, After only a few months. It was, it was in, it was when, the, now, see, I should, I should probably find that second email to be sure. Yeah. Because it seems like it happened within that same year. But, but, it, but it, it, might so, been, it certainly wasn't it a wasn't, matter of years. It wasn't a matter of years. Wow. Not at all. So that's relatively quick, yeah. really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, it was so... Um, and then we sat, uh, the four of us and Natasha's husband sat together uh, at the Dorfman and she didn't sit with us, you know, she couldn't watch it. And I was, I remember clutching my chest thinking, God, I hope, I hope this was ready to go. I hope, I hope it was, it wasn't too soon, I hope, because she might never write again if this gets kicked to shreds, yeah. do you know what I mean? And then it started and people around us were laughing and then everyone was crying and I went, oh, okay, it's fine, everything's yeah, fine. Your gut was right at yeah. the beginning when you <laughs> yeah. read it. Can you imagine if we'd gone, I'm not sure about this, Tash. Yeah. Actually, this is a good one to start with, but, you know, perhaps shelve it. <laughs> <laughs> then it became this absolute mega hit of the National. I know. Isn't that amazing? So that play, the play Nine Night, is, is like a godchild. I have that response to it. Yeah. Um... And, and Natasha's its mum. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, f I feel like, yeah, I was, I, that was my concern. Is, has this all happened too quickly? Is, is this play not ready to be seen yet? Mm. But it was so ready. <laughs> so ready. Yeah. So that's the brunch discussion. So, well, uh, it's funny because it, I always think, well, how am I going to start 
the ball rolling with any guests. And what I was thinking of you, it's funny you brought that up because I wanted to talk about sort of ethnic representation within the industry. And, I mean, certainly I've seen, cer I've seen certain changes. I just wanted to know, especially being a woman, if you're finding that it's moving in a positive direction. It's so positive. There's still miles to go. Oh, my goodness. Always. But, yeah, yeah. It, with everything, yeah. absolutely. And the more doors are, are kicked open, the more people realise their door is still stuck. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, but from the point of that group coming together, and I'm, I will forever be grateful to Sharon Duncan Brewster for just getting us in the room, I now say to young actors... Um, Things have really blossomed for us since we held each other's hands. Rather than going, there's only one part, and as much as I like you, I'm not going to talk to you till the, the auditions are over because then I'll have to talk to you about it and you might not know, and, you know, mm. all that bollocks that goes on. Yeah. We're sat there going, are you going in for that? And I'm like, I don't know, because, like, it's, it's shooting across so-and-so's birthday and... Are you... Well, yeah, I thought I would. I'm not really sure. I, I actually think it's her part. Oh, God, yeah, it is her part. That's what we're doing mm. now. My agent's always saying to me, will you stop casting things? <laughs> stop casting yourself out of jobs. Stop being so supportive. I'm like, I can hear somebody else's voice. Mm. And then, sure enough, who got it? She got it. Because she did. I could have right, told them. right all along. Yes. Yeah. Because she got it. Absolutely. And she'll be brilliant. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um... I think that's really oh, it's, healthy it's to so do that. It's so healthy. It's so healthy. And it doesn't... My not talking to you is not the reason I got the job. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't get the job because I scowled at you at an audition, mm. right? Mm. I might as well just give you a big old hug and say how you do and make you feel good, right? I love the fact that people whose work I respect and, and people that who are really good friends, but even if they're not really good friends, just people whose work I respect, they're getting work. Yeah. And I'm just happy about that. Um, and the, the, the more good work is seen, the more work gets produced, the more representation there is. So it's, it's, lovely, to, it's, it's lovely to hear people say, God, every, every black woman your age is kind of busy. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, and I've got no time for this kind of, oh, you know, it's lovely that all the black women get work because, you know, all the white women now don't get any work. You know what? That's so not true. <laughs> That's so not true. And I don't remember anybody worrying about us when we really were getting work. Exactly, you know I mean? yeah. It's so not true. I've got the, the, my friends, my, my white friends, my Asian friends around my age, busy, busy people. And I'm, I'm, I love it. It's fantastic. I really flipping love it. Because it's an age thing as well, you know, that people say, oh, God, you know everyone. I say, I know everyone my age if they're black or Welsh. Because we've been here a long time. We've been knocking around for 30 years. Do you, do you mind me asking how old you are? 51. 51. Yeah. So, I've been, so I left drama school 30 years ago, May just gone. I left early because I got a job. So I left early. And it's, I've been knocking around for a long time. So I'm not going to apologise for getting work. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, no, not at all. And nor um, should you. No, and yeah, of course I want work for everybody, and there isn't enough work for everybody. But there are jobs, there are gigs I don't get. But like I say, it's if there's something I I really think I could do well, and I don't get it, mm. I always say, "Oh, who got it? Who got it? Who got it?" Because if it's one of the people I know, I'll probably know they got it. It's okay. It's no one I know. Who got it? Who was it? Who was it? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, God, I thought she was still in the States. Oh, she'll do great. Do you know right. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, of course. So what else needs to change from your angle, do you think? Have you thought of things that aren't changing and you thought that they would have changed by the, now? The thing that's in my head at the moment, because I was at a Pippa symposium yesterday. Is that only yesterday? It seems like years ago now. Um, is... is that thing of parents and carers in this industry, just just give us a break when it comes to that, really. Yeah. And and I was, I recently heard someone from, a, not from my cast, from another cast, just um, with no irony at all saying, he was showing someone, I think he was showing someone pictures of his family, 
And he said, oh, it's so-and-so's birthday on Saturday. I don't know if I can go yet. I thought, it's Wednesday. Why don't you know if you can go? Mm. That's not right. You're rehearsing a play. Why don't you know if you're working on Saturday morning? Why is that OK? It's not OK. And it's really easy to change. But we can like, mm, do you know if I'll be working on Saturday? Because you know, it's my kid's like third birthday. But it's fine if we're working, just if you could tell me. Oh, I know, but it's like being held mean? to ransom yeah. there. And it's like, well, what comes first? Yeah. And it's, it's really easy. So the symposium is all about that. So that's big in my mind. That's really got to change. This idea that we, oh, well, ooh, we're scheduling. It's a dirty word, particularly in the theatre. No, it's not. It's really not. Um, and we'll all be a bit more efficient if we get on with it, quite frankly. And just make it unacceptable to, to not... But certainly by Wednesday, anyone that's rehearsing today... Should know. Should know mm. if they're working on Saturday. <clears throat> yeah. Without a doubt. So that just makes me angry. Do you find it easier or, excuse me, does it create more problems uh, being a parent? Because you've got two yes. kids, right? So when you're doing a piece of theatre or you're filming? Oh, well, I was working in Cardiff, so that was... Uh, weirdly, of course, it, it means that then my husband's... He's thankfully brilliant at, at organising, getting everyone where they need to be when they need to be there. But he's an actor as well, he's isn't he? He's an actor he? as well. Yeah. Um, but, but, of course, doing the job is easier because you get home and you can just sit with the script. You're not mopping the floor. I kind of went, oh, God, yeah, I'd forgotten what it's like to see a play away from home. So you just, you're just all about the play. <laughs> it's like nothing else to do. Yeah. Just bring home, how are you going? How's it fine? You're good, all right. Um... But the, but the so that but the challenge there of course is that you're away from home. So you got that to contend so got with that as to well. Contend with. But I think maybe doing a play is easier because you're rehearsing. You can still do the school drop off even if you can't do the pickup. Yeah. Still do the drop off and then you have to sort of leg it. That's the other thing. Could we just start rehearsals like ten fifteen, ten thirty? Yeah, just that. Just pushing just, it that little bit you know will I mean? will help. Just because most then you, you can get your kids and you're not. Don't have to do breakfast club, right? Yeah. And also, in certain cities, like London, it's cheaper after half past nine, so we could all just travel when it's a bit cheaper. Yeah. Since you're not paying us that much to do theatre, so, you know. Again, that helps everybody. Yes, And also, it? even if you have to drop the kids off at breakfast club, it's already a long day at school for them, do you know what yes, I mean? Yes, exactly. I mean, that just, let's just add another 45 minutes yes. or an hour onto their day. Yes. Just because I have to get into work. Absolutely. Then I'm coming home to that, and they're knackered, and it's a domino effect yes. for their week. So it yes. has the, the ripples go far with that. Yes, they do. Absolutely. And it, so it, I just think because it's not, you know, it's not like the the store has to open at such and such a time. Therefore, you know, we're doing a play, mm. right? So we can make it happen in whatever time we've got. We'll always panic, whether we've got three months or three weeks. There'll always be a panic, won't But there? you'll always get there. Yeah, you'll always get there. D regardless of the time frame. Yeah. If you've got eight weeks, you'll start kicking around. Absolutely. If you've got two and a half weeks, you'll get it done. Yeah. You just have to work a little bit harder. Yeah. I think you don't have that luxury that's... of time. Do you know what I mean? That's, mm. so, so that's big in my head. That's really big in my head. And they're kind of... And I'm sort of... I do think now, just in terms of, of representation, that uh, it works better if you've, if if the writer has seen who they want around the table, and it's in the script. I think that's just easier for everyone, because otherwise there are a whole bunch of conversations that have to have that nobody wants to have because they all seem a bit weird. Because I, I know that for, when we cast our 12th night, we kind of, you get into really weird conversations. You think, God, this is... If someone was listening to this, this is so wrong. Like what? OK, so none of this is meant to be offensive, right? And I know people will... People can get offended by this, which is why the conversation doesn't happen. But... <laughs> so you've got a cast and, and nobody... Uh, uh, you know that they have to be old enough to play the mother and father of that and so on and so on and so mm. on. Then you go, oh, well, um, it was, so we'll see all kinds of actors. Uh, um, I know a fantastic uh, uh, disabled actor. And everyone goes, great, bring them in. And then someone goes, 
But they can see, though, right? Because they need to see him get in the car with her. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. They can... See. Oh, good. Yeah. Or worse... Oh, no. That is their disability. Ah. Oh, no, then... Uh, well, uh, so we can see them for all these parts, but not that one, because whoever's playing that part has to, has to see that happen. Mm. OK, fine, fine. Um... Oh, oh, and actually not that part, because they have to overhear the phone calls. So if it's if it's hearing impairment, they have to overhear the phone. Do you see where I'm going yeah, with this? I see where this you're is going. really it's horrible territory. Because you just want to go, let everybody be like, mm, but in the script they do have to overhear that phone call. So as long as as long as they can hear stuff, then that's fine. Okay, not that part. Um and, and, and they, they can walk, right? So they have to run down the stairs of that house. Ah, uh, yeah, that... no, that's uh, there, there. So, room. well, not that part, then. Right. Should, um, uh, should we not? Uh, and Do you see what I mean? Gets, uh, right. It all becomes, no, this is far too difficult, let's just... Yeah. Right. So if the writer has seen the people they... But uh, that, then, of course, you're dependent on writers seeing the world beyond themselves. Which, as which we is, all know... Yeah doesn't happen all the time but if you leave those decisions to that that production meeting that's the kind of conversation which has stopped even before i stopped it because by then someone would go whoa, whoa, whoa i'm sure we're breaking some rules here just yeah. having this conversation yeah let's stop now see what i mean yeah i do but it's you know even down to where we're going to be shooting there's no lift. Are we allowed to employ some a wheelchair user if there's no lift? Are we breaking a law if there's no lift mm. in this on the set? Because mm. like, do you see what I mean? Yeah. There's no there's no accessible toilet on the on that particular set. Are we even breaking rules by? Ugh. But someone shouldn't have the answers to these questions. Someone should or shouldn't. Someone should. Someone should, yeah. yes. Yes. And so all that work needs to be done. And, and hopefully people who get paid a lot of money are working all this out right now. But but if you it's not being worked uh, out, yeah, you uh, would hope. But I think it's part of what stops progress because people go, I think we're in a minefield. Everybody back up. Back up. <laughs> Me? Let's go back to the safety of what we know. Of what we know. How things have been yes. done. Yes. And it's the same with... Um, I know, uh, uh, oh, I think she, she, him, him, him. Oh, this guy's, uh, oh. But if, if we cast the black guy, then when that thing happens in the story, are we saying that this character's racist because she doesn't like him? There's no particular reason that she shouldn't like him, so everyone's going to think it's its colour, but it's not. It's just she doesn't like him. Ugh, OK, step away, step away. Let's just go back to how <laughs> yeah. And people don't want to admit that's what happens, but that's what happens. Yeah. That's what happens yeah. all the time. You know, there's probably somebody whose job it is to just, okay, if we do cast this person, can you just go through every script and check and check we're not saying something we didn't plan to say? Do you think sometimes people overthink and stuff? Because that, I mean, that, of course, questions have to be asked. But if, if you're overthinking... And it all becomes too much, and the walls come tumbling down, and they go, "Oh, well, let's revert back to what yes. we know." Yes, yes, but but they do have to think. That's the that's the thing, isn't they it? They do have to think, absolutely. But if it goes beyond that, yeah, because you know, you could just decide to solve the problem. Well, yeah, well, there's that an would actor be the that I really want to give the job to, but the thing is, you won't you won't even bring those people in for a crack at the job. That's the thing. You won't, they won't be in the waiting room. And that's actually, I think, all that anybody's asking for, a chance to be in the waiting room. Well, yeah. Because how, how can you be... How can you be... Considered. Well, that's it. You can't even be fighting for something if you're not in the room. Absolutely. But, it's, but there's that thing of... And, and it, we like to think it's really easy to be in the room, but it's, it's... Oh, no, we don't. What I mean is we like to think that it's possible for anyone to be in the room. But it isn't. Well, we know that isn't the case. We know that isn't the case because there are all kinds of reasons which have nothing to do with, with your work or with the industry, just, you know, your, your CV, just that, those kind of conversations. And, and it's, all, it's no better to go, let everybody audition when you know that 
is not a cat to chance in hell. Mm. Well, that's going to the extreme as well, yeah. isn't it? It's like, of course, it's completely impossible to sling the doors open and let the crowds come rushing in. Yeah. And that's not conducive for anything. No. If or I anybody. Up a, no, it isn't, absolutely. And if I pick up a script and there's someone called Jemima and she's described as having blonde hair and blue eyes, I go, well, OK, they've, they're <laughs> oh, casting net white, that's great. But I can bet you when I walk into that room, they'll maybe, if there are four people there, maybe one of them has thought of Jemima in any other way, and that'll be the casting director. Mm-hmm. No, trust me. Honestly, you should meet her, right? Yeah. And you feel it. You feel the chill behind the smiles that is, that's not Jemima. That's not Jemima. I, yeah. I thought, I thought... I thought when she walked in, I'd get it, but I still don't get it. I still don't get it. Hi, Reiki, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> have, you have you found that? Oh, my God. And you'd, you know, you kind of go, is this just me being a, like a, a paranoid actor? But I go, OK, I'm willing to believe that was just about me. But what do you bet? Uh, what do you know that no matter who, no matter who read for Jemima, when you see Jemima cast, you go... I could have told you it was going to go that way, right? And she's going to be great. But I feel like you kind of wasted my time and you wasted your own. I was about to say, do you, you know? feel that, that is things that when that happens, that it's does a complete happen. waste of your time? And, you know, and there'll be loads of casting directors jumping up and down going, we never waste our own time. No, you, I don't think you do. But like I say, you were convinced... The other three people in the room weren't. Mm. And to me, that's like starting a race six feet behind everybody else, right? <laughs> I'm not even at starting line, yeah. right? Yeah. I need you all to think it's possible that I could do that job. Otherwise, please don't ask me. Please don't ask me to, to come and audition. And also, there's a, you've got a very limited amount of time there. Yeah. And in a situation like that, you've got to do so many different things. You've got to... Uh, com- at first, convince them that it could be possible. Yes. Then you've got to try and do a really good job. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I, I felt that. And, I mean, it's and an uphill, my, my it's absolute, not uphill battle. It is an uphill battle. My absolute proof that that happened, right, is years ago, uh, and when I say is uh, five years ago, mm. um, I got a call from my then agent would you... Somebody's dropped out. It was a guest lead in one of the detective series that was filming up uh, north of England. Would you go over to the casting director's office, which is all her, also her house? It starts filming this week. So this was maybe a Monday night. Right. So you kind of think in those circumstances, they're probably only calling in two of us, so, this, this, yeah, it's, it's worth dropping everything to do that. Mm. Um, and I go over. Next day, Tuesday... Don't hear anything. Oh, it must have gone to the other person. Next day, Wednesday, don't hear anything. I thought you could at least have got in touch. That's another bugbear. Um, and then on the Thursday, my uh, the, the agent at the time rang me and said, I'm furious. And I said, what? She said, I've just had a phone call from that casting director to say that the producers decided that character couldn't be black. And I was like, Oh, OK. The fact I didn't get the job is fine. I, I, you know, days ago decided that was the case. I'm not even worried about that. But mm. um, um, at, at what point, at what point this week did they decide this character could not be black? Yeah. Before I legged it across London or after they saw the tapes? I'm so confused on so many levels by that. She said, yeah, so am I. And believe me, she got a tongue lashing from me. You'd hope so, wouldn't you? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Why did you get me involved? I wasn't banging on your door going, please let me read for that part. I knew nothing. You called me. You called me. I dropped everything and got to you by six that same night. And then you decide? I mean, if someone's dropping that answer, which is very odd and kind of all sorts of bullshit, really, um, you, that needs to be widened. Give me more. Give me more I, to this. I, yes. This is not a simple one sentence answer. Absolutely. You need to give this a bit more depth. Unbelievable. 
I just... So, again, you've got... I have to believe that when she rang me, uh, or, or when she rang my agent, she thought I could play that part. Yeah. But she hadn't convinced anybody else. She hadn't clearly hadn't discussed with anybody. She, I guess she just said, I'll get some other actors in and you'll have someone. So she learned something too, I guess. Mm. You'd hope, wouldn't you? You'd hope. How many times have I said you'd hope at the moment? I know. But it's true, it's, isn't it? It is true. So I know it happens. I know that my time gets wasted, right? Um, and I don't... I'm not so desperate to meet everybody and just say hello to everybody that I need that to happen, you know? You might be the biggest thing in television, but if there's nothing... If, we, if there is no job that means we can work together, I don't now feel the need to just go in and say hello. Because, as you say, you've been doing this quite a long time yeah. now. There's not... You know, you can't carry on needing the need to prove. No, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's hard enough. And my, my friends that uh, aren't actors go, God, I couldn't cope with this constantly looking for a job malarkey. Always looking for a job, always hustling. Um, I go, yeah, well, that's the word of the self... That, that, that's the world of the self-employed and, and certainly the world of the actor. But there is a, a big difference to looking for a job and being on the hustle <laughs> because I know people in both camps there and some of it on the latter can be quite nauseating. Uh, well, yeah, that's true. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, that is true. And it's like, I always think, oh, just a little bit of self-respect. Oh, will go, oh, will go su such, such a long way. I love that you said that. Honestly. I'm not saying I always have it, but I do strive for it. Oh, please. I have... <laughs> I was just saying yesterday, I've burnt so many bridges. But they're all bridges I will never feel the need to cross again. I'm not standing there going, uh, draw bridge, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I just, I don't need to cross. It's okay. I'm like, you do what you do over there and I'll stay over here. We don't, we don't need to be in the same space anymore. So you I never think. regret those? No. No. All I regret is the times that I've kind of lost, when I've lost it. I have, I have one of those really really weird tempers. So you might have known me my whole life and mm. never seen it. Or you might have known me for five minutes and seen the worst of me. Um, uh, so I regret losing my temper, but it's I, I, because, because I, don't, I don't have that kind of gentle flow valve. It's, it's like everything's nice and then it's not. Then I have to admit it's not. Right. And then I'm then it, then I I just go like a powder keg, so I sort of so I regret not being able to deal with all that in a calmer way. Yeah, well, I was no. about to say I'm I burnt quite a significant bridge <laughs> recently. No, 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 oh. no, 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 many many years ago, and whilst I, ne I I don't regret kind of doing what I did, I'm trying to be very careful with my words. Um, I do regret the manner in which I conducted myself. I hear you, yeah. But as I say, it was a fair few years ago, a fair right. few years ago. So, I, you know, I think I tried to hold on with a little bit of self-respect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just need to justify that. Even if, no, I, just to myself, yeah, you know no, what I mean? I absolutely hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've... Um... I've, I've never, I think, I think I can honestly say this. I've never lost it with someone that other people didn't want to lose it with. And by lost it, I mean, you know, like I've never, there's been no violence involved. Just a lot of swearing right. and shouting. Um, a lot of swearing. <laughs> but, the, but, but I always end up saying the thing that everybody else might have said. So, so there's never a case of... How could you say she's so lovely? How could mm. you do that? It's always, God, I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd done that. <laughs> That's, so I take comfort from that. So you're fighting the injustices. I'm always, I, oh, in a ridiculous way. Like, I must have been a shop steward in a former life because, I mean, I'm really, <laughs> oh, my God. And, you know, my, my husband and my agent will go, you know, you don't have to be the person to solve this problem. <sighs> 
And I go, I know, but it's just every day. And it'll be... It's never stupid stuff, you know. It's never like there was no button on my costume and all that. No. I don't even know what that's about. But it's like way too many people are having a really bad time here and it's kind of your fault and you're not doing anything about it. Mm. And I'm, I'm someone who who will uh, who kind of put their head on a table like I can feel this. I can feel myself turning into the Incredible Hulk from the feet up. And I'm like, oh my god! I remember once actually thinking, I need, I need to leave this room because I'm about to. The the other version of me is about to appear. Yeah. I need to get out. I need to get out. I just, <laughs> but but I can only stall it for so long. So I might be able to stall it for days or even weeks, which is sort of worse because I was then say, when sometimes it goes, that worse because yeah. the thermometer within you sort yeah. of starts to build and you're repressing and repressing and it's going to have to come out and then it's just crack a tower. Yeah, and then. You know, it's so like watching a producer shout at a bunch of actors on a on a film set for for something that wasn't our fault. Somebody had, had left the shoot in disgust, and because there was no one else to shout at, the producer shouted at the people who hadn't walked off, mm-hmm. like we'd all been involved in it. We didn't have a clue she'd left, and there were two grown women crying, and I just we were in a Winnie Bago, right. So we, the three of us were sat behind the table and the producer was standing between the table and the sink and the cooker. And there were a couple of, of actors, male actors, standing. So the three women were sitting, the two men were standing and then this woman producer. And, and I could, I thought, oh my God, I'm, I could feel that version of me. So I, put, I actually put my head on the table. I put my head on my hands and she went, what's the matter with you? What? And I, that was like, oh, it was like a match. <laughs> I just went, you, you're the fuck, what's wrong with me? And there was no way out other than to climb over the table, right. which I did. So there's two people sat here. I climb over this little table in this caravan and I get to my feet. Luckily, the split second it took me to get over the table, I realised that if I used the power that I had in my fists, mm. she would probably fall backwards and die. <laughs> She'd bang her head on something. So I, I did self-regulate, but then all I did was nose to nose telling her where she could stick her film and her money and everything. By which time the two women who'd been in tears, had grabbed both my arms because they didn't know that I had already decided not to do anything. And they were screaming at her to get out. But before she left, because I said very little uh, that wasn't lovely up to that point, people could hear shouting from the Winnie Biggers. People, So I was aware that people were opening the door and going, fuck, it's Reiki, closing the door. <laughs> oh, my God, closing the door. And then she left. Uh, and she, she left the Winnebago? She, she left. Yeah. And I think the two men must have already gone, maybe to get help. <laughs> 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 and then the three of us just stood there and cried. And then we had to finish the shoot. We had to finish that day's work. It was the last day of, of the location shooting. We had to finish. Did you feel a release after that? Or no. Did you, was it, it, did you carry on being quite Oh, no, because day? then all I, all I felt was, or I just... I remember thinking, now everybody's looking sideways at me, going, we don't know you at all, do we? So, and that's horrible, that Where's feeling. Where's that come from? Yeah, I, I thought I <clears throat> knew you. I don't, I don't know who that was. That's, so, it's, so you just want to hide then. You mm. just, you just, you're just constantly apologising to people. And, of course, they go, no, it's fine because we were all upset, but they're also, you know, thinking, I, what, what the hell version of you was that? Um, it was someone that was obviously pushed to the extremes. Oh my goodness! We had to be re- we had to be made up again because all the makeup had gone south. We had to be made up again, and then I was I was walked back to set with with two uh, assistant directors on each side of me, like flanking you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but then when we got back to um, uh, to the the studio stuff, there was an equity member. People's agents got involved. The exec producers were on set. There was someone from Equity on set. It was like, 
you know. And the producer was told to keep away from us. Just, that sounds like hell. It was, it was all kinds of hell. It was all kinds of hell. And I would, for, for a couple of weeks afterwards, would, would shake at the thought of it because I just thought, God, I need, I need some anger management. And I thought, no, I did. I did manage my anger. I didn't. I didn't hit anybody. I stopped myself from doing that. <laughs> didn't escalate any further. <laughs> I mean, you did all right there, right? You I did mean, all right. It was like, I just, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was Where do you think time. it comes from, that build-up of anger within you? Oh, well, it's funny that my, um, I think when I, when I have spoken to people, and I always, uh, it's a, like a lot of, you know, every now and again, you think, yeah, I just need to talk to somebody who's just paid to listen. Um, and and I didn't know because when I was in drama school, they kept trying to access my inner anger. They they kept saying there must be more to you than that smile. <laughs> but we need to find it. <laughs> so they kept getting me things to do that would involve just getting really mad. And uh, and I think by the end of of my second year, they'd found it. They'd really tapped into something. But I didn't know what it was and. Uh, and I, I mean, it's, I think you know, like a lot of people, you, the, you don't need to, you don't need to delve that deeply, really. Some that the, the professionals have said that, um, just that thing of being given up, your, your mother giving you away. Although she never officially gave me away, she asked someone to look after me and never got me back. Mm. So there was nothing official. So there's that. But I, I never felt I'd been deserted by her. I was just theirs, and it was only as I got older that I just, I knew I was angry at her. I, 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 I felt something that I then realised was anger. Um, and also it was a very noisy, very volatile household. So I think in a way that's the bigger thing, that, um, that, that the violence wasn't directed at me, but as someone said, you were observing it, nobody ever asked you if you were okay with it or... Or apologise to you for it. So I think it was, you know, it's, it's sort of easy to find a route if you choose to. And also, you, you're watching certain things and no one's asking if you're okay, so you're trying to process yeah. that, and especially I remember, young. Yeah, and I remember, because I loved, I loved, uh, I read Little Women and Little House on the Prairie. I watched The Waltons, Pollyanna I read. I loved that world. Mm. So I knew there was another way to live. And I remember being small and thinking, it's not like this in any of my books. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I know there's another way to do this. And then I go to my mate's house and I thought, yeah, they, I don't feel like they're just behaving like this because I'm here. I think, I think they do actually get on. Yeah, this is their life. This yeah. is the norm. So I knew, and in a way, I think you'd probably be better off not to know that, not to have recognised that there is another way to live that doesn't involve this chaos um so i and i don't i i didn't ever think uh this is all happening because i'm not really your daughter i never felt that but i did think there is somewhere else i could be was there somewhere else you wanted to be i wanted to be one of the waltons i wanted to live in that house i really wanted to live in that house <laughs> passionately <laughs> <laughs> and then when i got to when i met um Adam and, and you know, he's got a big family and they're, they're, they function in the way families can. And I remember saying, oh, my God, I now have the Waltons and I'm terrified. Because <laughs> <laughs> now we don't have to talk to them. <laughs> Everything you wish for, here it is. Yeah, it's like, oh, my God, what do you mean your mother wants to talk about our curtains? Why? Why? I, I, why? And he was like, because she's not going to buy them. I'm just going to ask her where, where she gets hers. Yeah, but why? What's it got to do with your mother? And he's like, okay, Rakes, so what, I'm just going to ask my mother a good place to buy curtains. That's all I'm going to do. That's what, that's what, fam that's how families work, right? <laughs> 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 I'm like, okay. Sure. You, know I mean? you did touch on it briefly there, but do you want to just go back to early childhood and your mother? Well, yeah, there's, um, uh, my, my mother, who was also called Reiki, so she, you know, she didn't, <laughs> I guess, convenient name, <laughs> use it again. Uh, uh, 
was a, a student in. She was my. She was my father's second wife. Right. A, a sort of a Nigerian Muslim arrangement, but she didn't want to live down the road from his first wife, so she came and studied over here. Uh, in the 60s and would go back there to see him. And so I was conceived over here and then she was studying and couldn't... I think she had child minders and it wasn't working out. So she she told me that she then rang home to Sierra Leone, which is where she was from, and asked her mother if there was anyone who could uh, help her with this baby. Right. And, and she'd also had, before then, she'd had a sister, so I have a half-sister who's older and... Uh, who's about 10 years older, who was raised by my maternal grandmother in Sierra Leone, and then my brother, who's a full brother, who was raised in Nigeria by paternal uncles, uncle and aunt. And, um, and then she has me, and her mother said, well, you've got a cousin they haven't seen for years who's living in Cardiff. So I was born in London. Right. And then when I was a couple of months old, was taken to Cardiff. And... Um, uh, and didn't find out, incidentally, till I was about 12 that I wasn't born in London, which I decided to forget because I wanted to have been born in Cardiff. And mm. so I, I chose to forget that I wasn't born in Cardiff. Um, <laughs> but I, I think I should put that one to bed. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so they, so she, they, um, um, Amadou Ball, and his wife, Olive. So he was a Sierra Leonean merchant seaman who'd settled in Cardiff mm. and was working there and married a local girl. Olive Marshall was her maiden name. And they said they would take me in. They had a, a daughter who was 10 years older than me and my mother would come and visit, uh, I imagine, once a week and then it became once every two weeks and once a month. And when I was three she had the chance to go and live with her brother in Philadelphia and study over there. And, of course, by then I was there, so they said fine. But there was nothing official. There was no paperwork that explained why Reiki Iola, which I've always been, was living with Mr and Mrs Ball at all. <laughs> nothing. And nobody questioned it. Do you think that was just different times? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because no, nobody ever asked. And she used to take, when she ticked the box, parent or guardian, she'd always tick the guardian, uh, the, sorry, the parent box. Um, but, but if it would have been a very unusual, not impossible, but it would have been a very unusual circumstance for for those two people, one dark, dark black, one white, to have had me as mm. a natural daughter. Mm. Um, uh, and and yet she was my mum, and she was she was. Mrs. Ball, she was Ray Cayola's mother. Nobody seemed to ask why. And she was brilliant, my mother. She was a uh, full set of false teeth. Right. 40 fags a day. Slippers and headscarf, unless for special occasions. Um, you know, she could have walked off the set of Coronation Street easily, right. my mother. Um, and she was tough. You know, I went to visit a, a neighbour who still lives there, who's in her late 80s now, and uh, just uh, last year. And I said, oh, it, it's Reiki, Olive's daughter. Do you remember? Oh, of course, I remember you coming, coming, coming. I said, so do you remember my mother? And she said, oh, to be honest, Reiki, I was a bit of a f afraid of your mother. I said, yeah, with good reason. Because <laughs> <laughs> she was so tough. <laughs> yeah, you didn't mess with her. I mean, she was gr I loved her dearly. But, yeah, she did not mess about. And she was a, a cleaner, as far as I can... For my whole life, she was a cleaner. And my dad managed a club. He either worked in a garage panel-beating cars or he managed a club down the docks, Butown, Tiger Bay. When were you told that she wasn't your biological mother? I always knew. You so always I, knew? Yeah, I always knew. And, um, yeah, there was never a moment for me... I. So they must have been talking about it. Or maybe it's just that because Big Reiki, as they called her, would come and visit, I suppose they had to. So I knew that Big Reiki was my mother. Mm. But I didn't see her. Uh, so she left when I was three, and there's a picture of her and me when I was three. And then my mum, my Cardiff mum, and I went to visit her in Philadelphia 
But we were over there for five weeks and we saw her once in that time spent because she, she told us just before we left that she actually didn't have room for us to stay in her flat, in her apartment. She kind of left it to the last minute to admit that she was in a bed sitting. Thankfully, we had... The plan was that we would spend uh, the time with her and, and go and stay as well with my my mum's, my Cardiff mum's mate who'd married a GI. Right. It's a whole bunch of Cardiff women who married GIs and went off to the States. So they agreed to have us. So we spent five weeks in their house and one evening with my mother. That's all? Yeah. And she had a party. Uh, so we, we, didn't, we weren't even really with her because she had a party. So she invited all these people so they could meet her daughter. And I just remember people over my head saying, does she speak Creole? And, and her going, no. And them kind of looking at me and shaking their heads. It's a shame. So I was 10, 1978, and I was furious. I, that I was it's, it's funny I was I was I was angry enough to know that I wasn't going to answer her letters but I didn't talk about it nobody asked me how I felt about it I just thought I'm not talking to you it was, mm. it was like like falling out with a friend I'm not talking to you yeah. I'm not answering your letters and I didn't have any contact then until uh, uh, when I was 13 she decided to go back to Sierra Leone so she stopped off in Cardiff to see us and and she wanted to go to my school to see my school. So my, my mum and my mother and I went to the school and that was just weird. And then she went back to Sierra Leone and then my mum, my Cardiff mum, died when I was 14 and uh, my mother sent, uh, I remember sending a letter of condolence and then she sort of mistimed a bit where she put, um, uh, I hope I can be a mother to you now, and the timing was so awful that I did respond to that letter with, no, my mum is dead. And then I didn't talk to her again until I was about 20, 22, 23, when my brother came over and started building that bridge, rebuilding that bridge. So that's like almost 10 years. Yeah, I, I wouldn't answer any of her letters in that time. I, no, my mum was dead. Uh, and I didn't know who this other woman was that thought she could take her place. So I wouldn't have any contact. And then he came to visit. We'd never met before, so I think I was, I was 22 or so, he was 25. And, um, and he uh, was, was, had lived in Nigeria his whole life. Mm. Came to stay with me in Cardiff. And, and I think he must have read a newspaper article in one of the, the uh, Cardiff papers in which I talked about, you know, oh, my mum died when I was 14. And he said, could you stop saying that? Because my mother's alive, therefore so is yours. And I went, hmm, well, OK. Well, you took that on board? Yeah, I thought, yeah, I can understand that that's, that's a hard thing to read. Um, so I will now, and I think from then on, I, I would always qualify it with my Cardiff oh. mum mm. and my mother, my biological mother. Uh, to, so that he, it was weird for him to read that. And so did you start building a, a relationship with your brother at that point? Yes, and, uh, and he kept... And, it, like, I, I didn't... Ref, I think I'd, I'd referred to our mother, but I never... I didn't have a, a name for her. He would, talk, he would call her mum and talk about mum and will you talk to mum? And, and I, I'd just say, well, I, I don't really want to, but... I, I must have done all that for him because I didn't have any yearning to have a relationship with her, but I could see that it was really paining him. And I, I, didn't, I didn't want to hurt him. Or I, did, I, did, I hadn't thought about his feelings, I mm. suppose. So I, and I certainly wasn't, I wasn't interested in her feelings, but I didn't want to hurt him. So, so I started talking to her really just because it was easy to just... And you were, doing, you were doing something kind for somebody else because you were sparing somebody else's feelings. Yes, yes. So we, we got uh, talking and... And oh, I remember one day round at his flat, he, he was talking on the phone and he handed me the phone. And I said, hello, and someone said, hello, it's your father. And I went... I remember mouthing to my brother, what the fuck? And he'd hand... And I'd never had any contact with my father. This was the first time you'd spoken to your father? Knowingly, 
Whether he'd seen me as a baby, I don't know. But but I had never knowingly had a conversation with my father. And my brother just handed me this. I was like, you, please don't ever do that to me again. Oh, my God. I just remember going, oh, you, you sound quite severe. <laughs> no, austere, not austere. severe. Austere. You, 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 sound, you sound quite austere. And he laughed. And I'm not sure I said much else after that and handed the phone back. What was your relationship like with your Cardiff dad? We we got on up until the point my mum died mm. when we realised we'd never really had to deal with each other. So now I'm I kind of go, oh my goodness, I don't I don't have any memories or any photographs of my my dad and I on a beach, in a park, on a blanket in a field. Nothing. I don't have. I've got pictures of him in his house, mm. but I don't have any pictures of us anywhere else. And I think that's because he didn't do any of that. Uh, so the the day after my mum's funeral, uh, once everyone had gone home and, you know, suddenly the house is empty and it was just us in the house, I went, God, what do we talk about? Because you'd never had that, that never. dialogue before. No, never. And, um, and we... We found an uneasy peace, but, you know, then I kind of... I went from being a sort of model child. I mean, I wasn't... I wasn't... I'm not going to say that that I turned into something completely different, but I was... You know, he didn't want me to... Because he managed... He had managed nightclubs. He hadn't worked from a couple of years before my mum died, and, and he never really worked again. Um, and... But he'd manage nightclubs, so he wouldn't let me go to clubs. So, you know, 16, 17, everyone was going to these 18th birthday parties. He wouldn't let me go. Right. So, and we lived in, in a, a semi that had a, a council house, semi-council house, and it had a shed on the side. So a few times I would climb out of the landing window onto the shed, jump down off the shed where I had my clothes ready to go out yeah. in the shed. Also, some blankets in case I couldn't get in. Yeah. For later on. For later. <laughs> and there were, there were blinds, there were Venetian blind, blinds over that window. So I would say goodnight to him. And then it would take me ages to pull <laughs> this blind. Really slowly. <laughs> and then I'd get onto the shed and I'd have to let it down. <laughs> <laughs> and try and close the window as much as possible from the outside. Oh, God. You know, so you have to close the window first and then pull the blinds out. And I don't know how many times I got away with that. I just remember that. Sometimes now, when I leave the house and it's really cold, I'm reminded of spending the night in that shed. Uh, because I, I go, oh, yeah, I, I remember that kind of cold in your bones feeling. But there was one, but I know, hey, at least I wasn't shed. But there was one uh, time when I, I think I got back. I don't, oh, that's right, I used to. In order, in order to be able to get in, I would tell him that I'll, I would lock up. So I would say that I had bolted the front door. Yeah. So hopefully he wouldn't check it. And that worked a couple of times. And there's one time when I turn and it's locked. But then the door opens and he's standing there. <laughs> Got your number. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know what kind of row we had, but I went and I... I I said something about calling social services in that ridiculous way that teenagers do. And I went and sat in Ely Police Station. Just sat there, didn't, didn't ring the bell for any attention, just sat there until somebody realised I was in there. Do you want something? I said, do you mind if I just sit here a bit? Because um, uh, I've had a row with my dad. And they just let me sit there. <laughs> <Did they? Yeah. laughs> Ely is a district of Cardiff, but there's a massive council estate. Or it was when yeah. it was built. Uh, so yeah, I just sat there, and then and then the next morning, just went home. And I suppose we didn't speak to each other for a few days, and then life rolled on. Um, and oh. then uh, so that so that yeah, so it was it was. Uh, I remember somebody saying when my mum died, "Oh, you and your dad will get really close." Now that really didn't happen. That really, oh, really didn't. it never happened. No. No, we were never any closer. We just we just rubbed along. He was seriously grieving and I couldn't stand it. 
I couldn't. But even, you must have been grieving in your own way as well. I was, surely. yeah, I absolutely yeah. was. And I couldn't, I couldn't cope with walking in and seeing him with his head in his hands, just shaking his head at mm. the carpet. I could, that drove me crazy. Um, I, I didn't. I, yeah, I couldn't bear it, and and I didn't understand it. So, yeah, you know, we didn't get any closer. And then when I, um, I. I started, and I, I just threw myself into all the drama stuff then. At school? Yeah, at school, any youth theatre that would have me. So the National Youth Theatre of Wales... I was did, going to say, there's quite a lot going on in, in there's Wales. There's so much. And, and they had um, a summer residential course, and I auditioned for it, and I got a place, and um, I don't know who sorted out South Glam Education were going to pay for the place, mm. even though it, it was only, like, four or five miles from where we lived, but they wanted everybody to stay in the student accommodation. Right. And uh, and I remember saying to my dad, oh, I'm doing this residential course and I'll be staying in, in the centre of town. And he went, what, what? And I said, it's all sorted. You, should, uh, you just need to sign that. What? But, 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 I, like, honestly, just read the form, but it's sorted, Dad, don't worry about it. So it was that. So I, I suppose I knew then that that was possible. So then I... Um, uh, when it came to drama school, I auditioned for Lambda Central and Bristol, but I was a really young 17-year-old. I came to London, to all the London auditions on a coach, my, with my dad thinking I was in school, and then going around to a mate's house. We never knew where I was. Oh, we never knew? No, I didn't bother him with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember coming to uh, an audition for Lambda in a pair of three-inch heels, because <laughs> I was going to London, you had to put your... I, I got from catalogue, bought, yeah. some, bought some shoes from catalogue, I could barely walk, <laughs> so I totter into this audition. <laughs> and then I had to kind of do the audition in my socks, you know, on my bare feet, my tights, whatever I had on, because, of course, everyone's got their mm. pumps and things. And um, and then, to, and was it's not surprising I didn't, I wasn't offered a place at any of those, but I was offered a place at Royal Well. She wasn't royal at the time, and... And I didn't want to stay in the city. I wanted to go away, but... but Did you want to come to London at that point? Yeah, I just... Yes, I did. I just wanted to be somewhere else. Um, but the, but South Glam were going to pay for that three-year diploma, the grant and the subsistence, 100%. And then I was drowning at school. I'd already dropped English A-level, so I was left with French and music, but, you know, I had essays coming out my ears that I couldn't keep up with and mm. books to read that I couldn't keep up with. So that was me grieving. I just, I went from being a sort of model pupil to this person that was always late for handing stuff in. And, and I, I even got to doing that thing where you, where you write the, like the first two sides of an essay and you end mid sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just hand that in. And, uh, and then the teacher goes, where's the rest? Oh, have you not? No, is it not in it? Is it? Did it fall on the floor? <laughs> no, I haven't did that. It was ridiculous. I can't believe I actually did that. And um, but I was really struggling. I couldn't read the books fast enough. I couldn't do anything fast enough. So then I get this oh. place at drama school, and and I ring South Glam, Edu- South Glam Education, and uh, and I'm seventeen. I'm like, I just want to check. I've been offered this place at. at uh, Welsh College Music and Drama. Um, can you just tell me again? No, 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 because of your family circumstances, we are paying 100%. What, what grades do I need? No, you don't need grades. It's a diploma. You just need to turn up. Mm. OK. And I think I rang again. I just want to check again. <laughs> did I hear that uh, Did right? I hear that right? I just... So, 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 so it doesn't matter on the grades. Do I, do I need A-levels, though, of any grade? No. You, no, the place is secure. That's all I needed to hear. Christmas, before I was due to sit my A-levels, I hand all my books to my friend, Anne Dello. I'm name-checking her because she'll love that. <laughs> She's still my friend. She's a dear friend. Um, I gave all my books to Anne. I said, will you tell them I'm not coming back? And as far as I know, the school never turned up to see where I was. Really? <laughs> that was back when, it was like, when six, they were just glad anyone was in the sixth form back then. Of course. Remember when you didn't need grades to get in, they just, mm. come, please stay on at school, please stay on at school. So I, I gave her the books and I was doing, I'd been working Saturdays 
at Littlewoods and, and then I'd been doing like weekdays through the holidays. I stayed on. I just said to Littlewoods, look, I can, I can do more hours. Yeah. And the end of January, my dad looks up from his hands and goes, aren't this holiday's over yet? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, did I not tell you? Uh, yeah, I'm not going back there. I'm not going back <laughs> <laughs> And I think there was a row, can't remember. And I think he said something about you know, not being able to afford to send me. And I said, no, you don't have to. You've checked that already. So I just worked at Millwoods and then started, started drama school. And then got to drama school where there were loads of people. I think we were average age quite young. So there were loads of people who'd just done their A-level. So I immediately, <laughs> from week one, felt really thick. Right. Like, oh, my God. I just... Because... Ugh. Everyone's like, "What did you get?" I got this. I got that. I didn't do any. Yeah. Stop. Stop all that and just came here. Yeah. Yeah. And so I felt really stupid. And so I took the place. You know, how you need it when you do those. You go to drama school or uni or whatever. You just need a position. So the position I took, and you know, there was nobody else after it, so it was fine. Was the dumb black girl, and I was very happy there. <laughs> I just smiled a lot. I'll just label myself. As yeah, that. and that's exactly what I did. I just sat on a lot of laps. Do you know what I mean? And, and smiled and played with people's hair. Um, and someone reminded me recently who came to see uh, the play that um, she said, do you still play with people's feet? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's what you were known you for. You were known for every party. You would take people's socks off and play with their feet. I said, I hate my feet. She said, yeah, but I think you were looking for feet as ugly as yours. <laughs> you were in pursuit of more ugly feet. I don't remember any of that. I used to go out with a girl who was scared of feet. Oh, 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 bless. I'd keep my socks on all the time. Oh, <laughs> well, see, I keep mine on for other reasons. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Oh, poor thing. Uh-huh. Didn't yeah. last. Yeah. No, no you know, you've, got, you've got to learn to love feet. It's like, it's a given. Did you enjoy your time there? <laughs> yeah, I did. I did, because I, I said... I mean, I was, you weren't just playing really with people's young. feet and braiding people's hair and I things. was. Uh, <laughs> I was learning what I didn't know... <laughs> I was learning that I could tell you all kinds of things about Rogers and Hammerstein and Judy Garland and Anne of Green Gables, but I couldn't tell you anything about Ibsen, Beckett, Chekhov, um, Stanislavski. I couldn't mm. tell you any of that. So I learned, OK, there's a whole world of theatre I know nothing about. Then I went, oh, well, I'm not doing that anyway. It's fine. I'm just going to do musical theatre. Although I was on a musical theatre course, so I don't know why I thought that was going to work. Was that originally what you wanted to do, was just musicals? Yeah. Wow. Because that's all I knew about theatre. And and the Caucasian chalk circle, those sort of plays that youth theatres do. Yeah. You know. Um, then this whole world of possibilities yeah. kind of opens up. And to I you. went, oh, okay. So the the at drama school, once they'd tapped into this vein of anger that I had. <laughs> oh, we're going back through, to the anger. There we go. Then I went, oh. Okay. I, I see where you're going with that. And that was like, oh, yeah, I could, I could, I could be in that, I could make that work. But before then, I used to, I used to sit in the library. They have this uh, tiny library and a room full of, of cast recordings, mm. which to me was like a kind of heaven. I'd just sit there and listen to dream girls on headphones. <laughs> It was like, oh, and Chicago and all these musicals that... And, and just stare at the pictures on the back to get a sense of what the show was about. Mm. But I could sit there and cry at the beauty of... As, for me, that was theatre. And I'd go and I'd watch plays that the third years were doing and, and try really hard to stay awake. So even now, someone says to me, have you seen that play? And I go, well, I've been in a room when it's been happening. <laughs> <laughs> but whether I was you there... You know, Howard Barker's The Sea. Don't ask me anything about it. I just remember the third just did it and I watched it for a bit <laughs> and then slept. Um, <laughs> just what happened. Which is ironic now because now you're at the Royal Court. Doing a, yeah, exactly. Uh, doing, doing a big tap dancing musical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to clarify, she's not. I it's, really not. It, it's quite I'd the work it in if I could, though. Would you know? <laughs> I got. Oh, I love. I mean, I can I don't have the. I don't have the muscles or the chops for it now. But mm. I. Um, uh, my first job, I was offered a, a six or seven week job with a company called Made in Wales Stage Company, and it was adaptation of uh, a Welsh folk legend called Branwyn. So there was that. 
And there was the chance to be a, an ASM understudy in a national tour of hair for a year. Right, and a year. A year. Yeah. First jobs I was offered, and um, and I, I spoke to the head of acting, Andrew Neal, and I said, what do you think I should do? And without hesitation, he said, the play. And I did, and I'm, all, I'm so glad I did because, you know, all doors lead here. But uh, who knows what would be happening now if I'd done the musical because then my voice would have got better and I thought I'd be in the chorus of Lion King or something maybe. <laughs> Reiki, I, I feel we've only skimmed the surface. <laughs> I've absolutely adored talking to you and it I can't so thank you enough. It was so lovely talking to you. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I really did. Reiki, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And another episode is done. I mean, come on. I mean, I could have talked to her. For, I always say this, that I could have talked to people for hours, but that's the thing. I'm so curious and fascinated by people that we could, we could go on, but unless is more, we don't want to bore people too much. I hope we don't. Do we? We don't, do we? Um, a massive thank you to Reiki and a massive thank you to you for downloading and subscribing. You know where we are. We're on all the socials at Two Shot Pod. If you want to drop us a message, you know we always respond to you. We always try to. I think we do. We do. We do. Um, we're also at Two Shot Pod at gmail.com. If you want to come as our guests to York Theatre Royal to see JB Barrington and Art Malik. Only four tickets available. You'll be our guests. Email, let us know. We'll sort you. Um, right, well, that's it, isn't it? That's it. Next week. Oh, I'm dying to tell you. I'm dying to tell you. And I can't. Oh, my goodness me. I keep getting involved. I should have turned my finger off. Pinger? That's, I'm, I'm calling it a finger. When you turn your phone off, I should have done that. But that's the same person that's doing that. Um, and he shouldn't be doing that, to be honest, because it's late. It's my fault. Right, OK. So next week, I'm going to give you some clues. Right. It's not an actor. It's not a musician. It's not a poet. It's not an artist. But it is one of my favourite broadcasters, okay? That's it. See, I'm t my throat's getting all tight because I know the conversation that we had and uh, it, it, it's up there with one of my favourite episodes that we've done and uh, I think you're going to really love it. Right, I best go get this uh, ironing done. Hey. Okay, look. You have a fantastic uh, week. Stay safe, stay sound. And until next week, I've been Craig Parkinson, he's been producer Griff, and this has been the Two Shot Podcast. Take care of yourself. Lots of love. The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers. <laughs>